So you press a little further in your reading in Chemnitz, and we're picking up about page 157 thereabouts. Any um, observations, anything stand out to you? How was the reading for today? Thorough. Thorough. Like I told you, Kamenitz has, has got an agenda here. He is trying to be comprehensive. He wants to cover well, the... Well, I was talking about being brief, but then he just keeps writing. It's like, <laughs> it's like he's trying nuts. It's like, I'm going to take this as simply as possible, and then he writes like another 10 sentences. Yeah. Simple and long are, are not mutually exclusive. No, they're not. All right, John? Well, he seemed um, to want to make very, very, very sure that he maintained the balance between... Yes. Um, you know, the division and the unity. Because oh, yeah. he, he would kind of start leaning in one direction or the other, and then he would suddenly throw out a whole paragraph like, whoa, but this is what I'm not saying. That's oh, yeah. Sure recenter, and then he would kind of slide off again, <laughs> and then he would come back. You're reading well. That's exactly what he's doing. Yeah, sir. Um, I just overall, I feel like I can appreciate more what he's saying, having like discussed this with Keeper and kind of already gotten some of the basis for it. Like, I understand why I did that first because it's like, okay, now I can follow you. And right, okay, good. So you see there's a method to how I do it. So I introduce you to the terms a little bit so you kind of get some sense of where he's going to go. But then you get to let him kind of build the whole thing out. Okay, good. All right. I was impressed with how well read he is. Yeah. yeah. He's quoting all of these different guys and he's saying like in all of their writings, they only say this about it. Yeah, I know. It's impressive, isn't it? His, his command of the fathers is really quite remarkable. And then it's always good to remember, he, he did this without any kind of electronic searching or databases or anything. You know, you just basically have books on the shelf, and you remember where you read stuff and keep track of it. It's, it's very, very impressive. I agree. All right? Yeah? Uh, just a question on the, he keeps quoting, probably more than anybody else, the Damas Damascus. Is that John of Damascus? Um, I think so. Yeah, I believe so. I, I'm, I'm not a, a patristic guy at all. Well, so neither I am I, but like, I recognize pretty much every other name, or most of the other names, and then you get to him, who he quotes a lot. Yeah, I, think, I believe that's who it is. I believe that's who it is. Yeah, I'd have to do some double-checking, but I'm pretty sure. Yes. Yep. Okay, good. Anything else? Yes. When did the terms gainus, myostat, like all those, because he never really, he just called Yeah. Them, now, you're, you're right, Anthony. Um, you picked up on that. He, um, he's not hung up on terminology. And in fact, the terms that we are using, the gain, acetomodicum, apostolismodicum, myostoticum, he doesn't use that way. Now, he used the words, but kind of, he's not hung up on it. And I'm not sure, you know, when they'll start to kind of get locked in. Peeper likes them and kind of uses them that way. And it's probably just kind of the conventions start using them more and more consistently. But there's a good lesson there as well. I mean, Chemnitz is not getting hung up on this term, that term. And we shouldn't necessarily either. It's more, what are we conveying by this? And are we being accurate in our, in our conveying these things? All right? Good? Good. Good. Well, let's make sure we see what's going on in here. Um, so today, we're going to be talking about what results from the hypostatic union. And again, hypostatic union should be recognized. When you hear this, just think about this is nothing more than the personal union, which is nothing more than another synonym for incarnation. Really, right across the board, these are all synonyms. So the hypostatic union and the idea of incarnation are really synonyms. That's, that's exactly what's going on here. So the hypostatic union is nothing more than the description of the personal union. And hypostatic is just the Greek root, and persona is the Latin root. So personal union, hypostatic union, all means the incarnation, the coming together of the full human nature and the full divine nature in one person. So that's essentially it. And we have the axiom. It's going to be playing out again and again and again. This is just the basic truth to Natures, human and divine, coming together in one person. That's the hypostatic union. All right, now he's going to unpack this, though, today. And by unpacking this, he's going to do this into the categories of these genera. And we've talked about that already. So the discussion today is going to be really zeroing in on the first two of the three genera, and then the third one we'll do next week and pick up his last section, which is the whole humiliation, exaltation. I'm overloading the microphone, right? Yeah. No. Oh, the chalkboard, yeah, yeah, a little scratchy sound. All right, <clears throat> so 
that's where we're going today. We're going to be thinking about the first two of the three genera, and this is what he's going to be discussing. Now, a couple things to notice along the way. We're just going to crank through this like we've done other times and just see where um, Chemnitz leads us in this. He points out how important it is that we're very careful with our use of words, which is contrasted with, and he says, I'm not hung up on terminology. Yeah, all right, so the terminology might be fluid and there might, or might, it might be um, open to more than one word or term being used, but when it comes to your definitions, you need to be precise on what you're talking about. And we need to be careful and, and very sharp about this. Um, he quotes Augustine here, let him keep his ideas, but let him correct his tongue. And there's good advice there. You know, we can't kind of create our own words. Um, coming up with new terms just for the fun of it is not a wise thing. And, you know, filling terms with new meaning is not necessarily a wise thing either. It's not helpful because we end up creating confusion and creating problems. So we need to be very careful about this. All right. So then he gets into what he's going to talk about here, the, what results from the hypostatic union, and he's going to lay this kind of out in these generalities, first of all. Page 158, top of the page, end of the paragraph. Therefore, we must carefully examine and retain, according to Scripture, not only the natures themselves and their union, but also that aspect of the doctrine which pertains to those things which arise from and follow the hypostatic union of Christ's two natures. So what are the implications? That's what he's going to be thinking about today. Where, where does this go? What do we learn from this? And he then starts following some of the fathers, just talking about this a little bit more. All right, going forward, oh, 161. I knew there's one more thing I wanted to hit in this chapter before we move on to the details. Um, 161, this is a fascinating paragraph. First full paragraph on 161 where Chemnitz writes, Furthermore, the doctrine of this communication, which results from the hypostatic union, can be summarized in one comprehensive definition. Now, term communication. What do we mean by this? We hear the word communication, and in our 21st century world, we immediately think, oh yeah, that's a major in college where you learn how to give speeches, or maybe you learn how to do broadcast communication and you know you want to be a weather man or something like that and that's communication so communications major you learn about speech or writing or media and here communication is a much more fundamental definition communication simply means to take from one and give it to another to communicate something like a communicable disease just means you communicate it from one to the next so we're going with a very basic definition of communication. So the communication of attributes simply means giving of the attributes of the nature to the person. That's communication of attributes. Or, in the case of the third genera, the, the third genus, the actual communication would be the communication of some divine attributes to the human. We'll talk about that next week. But the communication simply means the passing over or the giving over. The, so it's a very basic definition. All right. So what do we mean by this communication? He says it's possible to do it in one comprehensive definition. But for my part, I must confess that in my simplicity, I cannot extricate myself from the abstruse arguments relating to this teaching unless I have made clear certain distinctions which the doctrine itself points to and brings to light. When we have shown these distinctions and solved the problems relating to them, it will be comparatively simple to explain the entire matter. Thus, we can understand it more easily and consider it more expeditiously. And then he skips down a little bit, and he says towards the bottom here, oh, let me continue there. I might also note that our church has approved this simple method in their opposition um, to the notions of the sacramentarians, Zwinglians, anybody who's going to deny the Lord's Supper's presence of Christ. That is, that the doctrine of the communication of attributes is divided into certain definite, distinct categories. And these individual classifications are explained by particular definitions. The matter itself clearly demonstrates that these categories are distinct and different from one another. Definition cannot help being upset and obscured if things which are distinct are confused and not distinctly explained. Although it is the happy condition of great geniuses that they can in one sentence explain without confusion things which are distinct, Yet, I shall speak in the method which is best suited for simpler people, both for teaching and for learning. Now, what's Chemnitz saying? Yeah. He's going to explain things for first graders. Yeah, he's going to do it kind of, you know, theology for dummies. And he's going to do it as simple as he possibly can. He's not going to make it complicated. And that is part of the reason why it's so long. I mean, he says, you know, I could boil it down and pack it down tighter, but it's not going to be clear, and that's not going to be helpful. So we want to make sure we make it clear, and to make it clear it takes more words. And if you've ever done any kind of writing, you know what I'm talking about. When you try to clarify something, it means longer. And the more you have to explain something, the more you've got to write. And the more you're trying to be explicit and clear about it, the more you've got to write. 
It's kind of how it goes. And it makes the, it's always a challenge because good writing is succinct and yet it's got to be able to communicate and the challenge is always finding that way to get the words across. So that's what Kemet is saying. Now, what else is he saying about himself? The first part of that paragraph. Yeah. He's no. not a genius. Yeah. He doesn't put himself in the genius category. Now, whether this is just rhetorical effect, you know, he's trying to kind of win you over like, oh, I'm just one of you, like a politician. Yeah, I just, you know, poor, I was a poor child, you know, raised in rural Arkansas or whatever. What's that? A man of the people. A man of the people. He's just a normal guy. Maybe that's it. Or maybe he's being straight up and honest. All right. So we have this along the way here. Then he gets into the details. The meat of the argument picks it up, page 162. And this paragraph really does kind of capture where he's going with the real concrete part of this argument. In the first place, we have pointed out that in the incarnate Christ, there are and remain two complete and distinct natures, the divine and the human, each of which possesses and retains its own essential attributes without any confusion or abolition of them. These two natures in Christ do not subsist individually by themselves or separately, so that there is one Christ the God, another person who is Christ the man, but they are united into one hypostasis or person, so that there is one Christ, who is at the same time God and man. Therefore, the attributes of the natures in Christ are not attributed only to that nature of which they are the property, nor distributed as Nestorius held, some to Christ as God and others to Christ as man, so that they are attributed as, so as to two persons, but just as there is a hypostatic union of the natures themselves to form one hypostasis, so also there is one hypostasis or person of both natures. Thus, also because of this union, a certain mutual alternation of the attributes or a communication of the attributes takes place within the person. However, since no conversion or confusion of either the natures themselves or other essential attributes takes place in this hypostatic union, and since these two natures are united but not made into one composite nature, rather joined into one hypostasis or person. Therefore, just as through this union, deity does not become humanity, nor humanity deity, so the substantial property of the one nature does not become the substantial property of the other in the abstract. That is, the substantial property of each nature essentially and formally inheres commonly and equally in each nature. Otherwise, there would be a commingling or an equating. Of course. Now, as dense as that sounds, you're getting to the point where you should be able to read that and say, yeah, you really should be. Because you just kind of track it through, think about what he's saying, think about what the terms mean, and don't get put off by the vocabulary that's a little unusual. You just take it apart, think about each thing, and you realize, yeah, yeah, yeah. So what he's really saying is, you've got two natures which stay two natures. The human doesn't become divine. Divine doesn't become human. And yet, in the person of Christ, they are both fully communicated to the person of Christ. That's what he's saying. But we don't lose the human and the divine. So even in the union, you still have human and divine. And yet, we don't have two Christs. We only have one. That's what he's saying. Obviously, this is going to escape human comprehension. That's the whole problem of it. And that's why you've got to say it again and again and again and just hang on to the revelation regardless how difficult it is to get your mind around it. So that's what he's doing. He's hanging on hard to this basic idea of this. All right, so now the next couple paragraphs, what he's going to do is he's going to overview each of the three genera, the genus idiomaticum, apotelismaticum, and then myostaticum as it relates to this because the three genera are nothing more than the explication of the hypostatic union. So the first one up is the genus idiomaticum, first complete paragraph, halfway through. For such a division of works would be followed by a division of the persons, for the actions, as Damascenus says, are not of the natures but of the person. Hence, the property, which is characteristic of one nature, is communicated or attributed to the person in the concrete or through a concrete term. And then finishing it up down here, that which is proper to the one nature is predicated of the person concretely. It is customary in this predication to have the statement that something is attributed to the person according to a particular nature. And that becomes a standard way of talking. All right. Um, a couple of more terms we need to talk about. And we'll do it this way. I'm going to go ahead and kind of hit the terms all at once, then we'll see how Kevin kind of unpacks these. First term we want to talk about is concrete and abstract. And as things go along, he's going to quote quite a few fathers using this, and he even follows Luther, who uses this terminology and likes it. So what does he mean by this? He talks about this in the concrete and in the abstract. What he means in our context is really very simple. 
We don't have to go wafting off into too much heavy-duty philosophy to get this because essentially he's having in mind the whole discussion about Christ and the hypostatic union, and in that context, it's not too complicated. Because in our context, the concrete always refers to the person, Christ. And the abstract always refers to one or other of the natures. That's what he means by this. So the abstract refers to humanity in general. Deity, that would be an abstract term. The concrete would be Jesus Christ, the man, or Jesus Christ, God in the flesh. That would be concrete. So, and what he means by concrete is it's individualized. You know, this is actually kind of an important point on a side level here, the fact that Jesus Christ becomes incarnate in a particular person. This man, this time, this place, this guy. He's concrete. He's he's incarnate in this person. And he's not incarnate in all of humanity. You know, there are sometimes people kind of start talking about, you know, you have the Jesus within you and how Jesus shows up here and he shows up there and he's, he's incarnate in many different places. No, that's not what we confess at all. Jesus is incarnate in this particular place and it's what we mean by the local presence. This time, this place, this man. So a, a male Jew living in the first century in Palestine, the son of Mary, stepson of Joseph with brothers and sisters, that's that Jesus, localized, concrete. So very real, very concrete. That's what we mean by the concrete referring to the person, Jesus of Nazareth, son of man, son of God. That's the concrete. The abstract is humanity in general. Now, this is easily understood when we think about what we're talking about. So. If the hypostatic union says that all of the human nature of a man and all the divine nature of God are given fully and equally to Christ, that means that Christ has all the attributes or the idiomata, there's another term for us here, attributes, characteristics, and then the other term, the Greek one is idiomata. Any one of these three, these three terms all mean the same thing. These are just the particularities that make um, humanity humanity, the particularities that make deity deity. These attributes, characteristics, or these idiomata are given fully to the person of Christ. And when that happens, we say that Christ then possesses all the characteristics of humanity and all the characteristics of deity. But, does humanity then possess all of deity, or deity all of humanity? No, that would be the abstract. So, what's true in the concrete person is not true in the abstract. For example, God died. In the concrete, is that true? Yes. In the abstract, is it possible? No. All right? So that's what we mean by here the between the concrete and the abstract. In the concrete, we can get away with saying things because it's true in Christ. So God um, uh, wept, and God suffered, and God died. Oh, no, you can't say that because that's not true. That's, that's true of humanity. Or God got hungry. What is that? Uh, in, the, in the abstract, it's nonsense because by definition, God doesn't do those kinds of things. People do. Humans do, but God doesn't. And yet, in the concrete, we can say that. Or we can say God's, or the blood of Jesus gives life. Now, what blood gives life? Well, I know Red Cross will tell you otherwise. Go give blood on Monday. Um, but the idea that you, know, you just dump blood on somebody and they come to life, you know, there's like life in the blood, we don't think that. And yet, when we say the blood of Christ gives life, it's true because now humanity somehow has what deity has, the ability to give life. And this human blood is actually life-giving. And so it's true in the concrete, but it's not true in the abstract. And so what we can say about Jesus in the concrete, we can't necessarily say about the two natures. So we keep them straight. All right? Now this is important because if we're going to maintain the um, two natures, we have to be able to say humanity stays humanity and deity stays deity, and they aren't kind of mingled into this sort of new thing, the Eutychian blender Jesus. That's what we're trying to avoid here. 
So we want to make sure we keep the true humanity and the true, true um, deity. All right, so that's the, one of the first terms we need to deal with here is this concrete and person. And then the other one we need to talk about here is this word predication, which really sounds like, wow, what is that? All right, so now we leave behind the world of philosophy and enter the world of grammar. So English majors, you have your moment here. Um, when we're doing basic English grammar, we have a certain kind of a sentence called a predicate sentence. And what does that mean? Anybody? I know, I know English majors are always very shy and very bashful and don't want to be too proud about this, right? All right? Yeah, you won't admit it. All right, so a, a predicate sentence is a very simple one. We'll capitalize all the nouns. We'll play German for a minute. All right, so John is smart. Um, so basic, simple sentence, and this would be an example of a linking sentence or a predicate sentence because our verb, our main verb, is a verb of being, right? Form of the verb to be, and it's not a transitive verb, but it's simply a linking verb. And so this is what we call a predicate sentence because John is smart. The is is just pulling them together. So smart we would say this particular adjective is modifying John and is therefore the predicate of the sentence. Remember that? You have bad memories, right? Unless you had a really good teacher and you enjoyed it. So that would be the predicate of the sentence. So John is smart. This is a predicate. So we would say that smart is a predication of John. And so when we start talking about the predication of things, all we're doing is essentially the attributes of a particular substance, take the predicate spot. So humanity is passable, humanity is mortal, humanity is fallible, and write down the list. All the things about humanity. All those characteristics or attributes are predicates of humanity. God is eternal. God is omniscient. God is omnipotent. All right? All of those is's are the predicates of God. And so by predication, we mean these are the attributes. So what we're saying essentially is that in Christ, the predicates of either the human or the divine are given to the person. That's what he means by, by predication. So we're applying the, the terms, the attributes of the one to the person. Okay? Getting our vocabulary here. Uh, and again, the, my goal here is not so much to teach you English for, um, grammar, but my goal is to help you understand the language and terminology of what Chemnitz is up to so you can kind of see the force of his argument and the consistency of it all the way through. Okay? All right. Now we're ready to launch into our discussion of the three genera. And the first genera is already illustrated by what I've got up here. The genus, what we call idiomaticum, which is the genus of attributes or characteristics. And the genus idiomaticum is spelled out, as I've already said on page 162, we've already talked about this, and the idea is that the characteristics of each nature are given fully to the person because of the hypostatic union. So all that the humanity is, is given to the person of Christ, all that the divine nature is, is given to the person of Christ, and they're fully his. I will talk more about to what extent the divine nature is present in Christ when we talk about the humiliation and exaltation. That's Chemnitz's last discussion. We'll take that up next time. So that's obviously a discussion, but we'll kind of hold that for a minute. But the point now is he's got everything. And that's why we can say things like Jesus is hungry. All right, because, you know, in Christ he is hungry. So the human who hungers, Jesus can be hungry. That's Gainus idiomaticum. Then we have, so we'll call that, we'll get a label up here. <clears throat> and this, remember, is Peeper's favorite language. He likes to call it the Gainus idiomaticum. Um, Chemist really prefers to call it what? The first. <laughs> yeah, I like that. The first Gainus. That's his, his terminology, pretty straight. All right, so then the second Gainus for Peeper, or for, well, for Peeper, well, no, not for Peeper. The second genus for Chemnitz, Peeper calls the genus Apotelismaticum. Genus Apotelismaticum. 
and the genus Apotelosmodicum comes from another Greek root, just like idiomodicum is from idiomata, the characteristics. Apotelosmata is Greek for the result or the completion or the fulfillment. It has the same root of teleo, to complete, to end. And then so apotelosmaticum is the result or the completion, the, the action that results. That's the kind of idea. So again, it's apotelosmaticum, and implying very much something happening, an action toward a result. So the genus apotelosmaticum is described on page 163 in the second complete paragraph, six lines in. Therefore, the descriptions and the works of the offices of Christ are attributed to his person, not according to only one nature, but according to both. And the person in these offices carries on activities in and according to both natures at the same time. And you already know where we're going with this because we've talked about it. So the Gainus Apotelus Monicum says that whatever Christ does in the work of his ministry, in his Apotelus Mata, the the actions, the works, the results of his ministry, all of these are always carried out according to both natures. The human and the divine are fully involved in everything Christ does. And what we're really stressing here, and you, kinda, you can think about this a little bit, the first gainus really goes after and goes against Eutyches, right? Because Eutyches wants to say all that matters is the union of Christ, and the natures kind of get lost. And the Gainus Idiomachum says, no, 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 the human nature and the divine nature are both fully represented, given to Christ, and they're distinct. The Gainus Apotelus Monicum is really going after Nestorius, because Gainus Apotelus Monicum says that whatever Christ does as a person, he's always doing according fully to both at once. So it's not like switching between, you know, a binary kind of a, a digital sort of a thing, where it's either, okay, we're doing the God thing or the man thing. Click, 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 click. And people think this way a lot. Okay, now he's doing the God thing. Right, now he's clicking over to the man thing. That's almost how Nestorius talks. And what we're saying in the Gainus Apotelus Monicum is, no, when he does anything, it's always according to both natures all the time. Both. What page did you say that Apotelus um, This is page 163, middle of the page. He, he does this quick introduction to that. All right, and then he introduces for us the third category, which we're not going to talk about today in detail, so we'll get, but we'll get to that, and that's going to be the genus myostaticum. And that's the idea that whatever the divine has is given to the human because of the hypostatic union. The characteristics of the divine through the hypostatic union are shared with the human, humanity to the extent that they need to be for God, Christ to carry out his work and more on that later. Chemnitz, I think, saves it for last because it is the most controversial of them, and Pieper sticks it in as number two, so the ordering between two and three are different between Pieper and Chemnitz. But don't be thrown by that too much. All right, and the Gainus, Gainus Myostaticum he talks about on page 164 with its key word, perichoresis, more on that later. All right, so these are his introductions, and then he's going to now start getting into this a little bit more. Page 167, top of the page, he argues that there is clarity among us as to the teachings, but not as to the terminology. But when people can agree on the substance, they should be tolerant about the terms, which only serve the doctrine. Thus, it is worthy of effort on the part of all pious and learned men for the sake of harmony that we use well-accepted terms, especially those used by the early church, when they are proper and meaningful and not unsuitable. So, be consistent, use the terms you've been, you've been given, and follow through on this. And that's what he's laying out here at the beginning. All right, anything else on chapter 12? All right, now we're going to make sh back up a little bit. He's given us the waterfront, and we're going to go into detail on the first of the three genera, the genus idiomaticum, and spend some time on this, the communication of attributes, the first genus of communication of attributes. And you see, every one of these really is underneath the category of communication of attributes because they all have to do with what's being communicated between the human and divine and the person of Christ. Here, the communication to the person. Here, the communication to the natures. Here, the communication from divine to the human. They're all talking about the communication of attributes. You know, this is the way it is with so much of theology. You just take your time to learn some of the terminology, and everything kind of just drops into place. It's not a big deal. So the mystifying thing is just the oddness of some of the terms and the, the language. But once you get that figured out, it's all a piece of cake. And I think that's true. All right, 171 into the very first paragraph. The common definition of Philip, and who's our Philip here? Yeah, Philip Melanchthon. 
however, is that the communication of attributes is a predication wherein the property which belongs, to, and there's another word for you, add to this list, property, another synonym for the characteristics, wherein the property which belongs to one nature is attributed to the person in the concrete. Now, let us examine the foundation of this doctrine, the first degree or gayness of communion, for it is sure and clear. All right, so that's what we're going to talk about here. This is first gayness. Um, for those of you who are really into your Greek, page 172, he quotes Council of Chalcedon in the original Greek. And that's sweet. And if you are looking for it, you can actually find it. And this is about five lines up from the bottom of the Greek. You have the four negations in their original Greek. And there are four adverbs. You have ansumkutos and atreptos, adiaretos, and akoristos. And these are the four negations of Chalcedon. Without uh, mixing, without change, without division, without separation. And so these are our four negations of Chalcedon, kind of laid out here very clearly for us on page 172, Tran uh, one translated for us on 173, and here we have the translation, unmingled, immutable, undivided, inseparable. Now, we see the, the four negations of Chalcedon, very interestingly, are aimed again at the errors, and the errors are Nestorianism and Eutyches, Right? And I showed this before, right, how the four break down to the, the different uh, heresies. So the two, immutable and unchangeable, really are aimed at, um, or unmingled and immutable, are really aimed against Eutyches, who would have them blend together. And then the inseparable and undivided are aimed right at Nestorius, who would have a division between the Jesus who is a human being and the Jesus who is God. And we're saying no to both of those. So the communication of attributes in the Gainus Idiomaticum is really reinforcing Chalcedonian Christology one more time. That's the goal here. All right, top of 175. Thus the words which denote the united yet distinct natures we call abstract, and those which indicate the person are called concrete. Therefore, one nature is not predicated of the other in the abstract. The deity is not called humanity. And he continues on a few lines later. For it is not correct to say that the humanity in an essence gener is an essence generated from the Father from eternity, or that the deity is pierced with nails or wounded with a spear. But it is perfectly correct to say concretely that the Son of Man ascended where he was before, that the Lord of glory is crucified. We shall discuss under the second and the third gainus how each nature in Christ acts in communication with the other and how supernatural gifts are communicated to his human nature. So that will be the Apotelos Modicum and the Gainus Myostoticum. And we'll get there in a little bit. So, the, again, the concrete and the abstract come through here. The abstract simply referring to the natures and the concrete referring to the person, the personal union. Page 178 wraps up this chapter. Last six lines in the page. They also imagine that each individual nature in Christ carries on its own activities without communion with the other. But the entire doctrine must be tied together by the three classifications or genera. And these classifications are distinguished from each other because we cannot say everything at one and the same time. Yet the distinctions must not be destroyed, but preserved, each in its proper order. What he's kind of getting at here is, and we've mentioned this before, all three of these really are working together kind of simultaneously. And it's not like you kind of pull them apart into neat little categories. We do that only for the sake of teaching, for the sake of trying to get this across. But in reality, you really can't pull them apart because they're all inter intermingling and working with each other and happening concurrently within the um, hypostatic union. All right, questions on chapter 13? Yes. Um, yeah. Could you real quick go over the seven... Uh, points on 176. I guess after you giving an easy definition of concrete and predication, mm -hmm. that would be a lot easier. But when I was reading them, I just kind of glared at them and wasn't sure exactly what they were saying. Okay. So we're concerned with the question of how the attributes of the person are attributed to the person. So he's, gonna, he's got seven points. Chemist is magic seven. When in Scripture the property of the divine nature is predicated in concreto, of the divine nature in Christ, um, this is one way. So what the Father does, these things the Son also does. So what we're saying is the divine nature is given in the concrete to the Son. So the Son has the divine nature. 
Second, when in Scripture, the property of the human nature is predicated in concreto, the human nature. Son of man is betrayed in the hands of sinners. Crucified rises from the dead. So this is something the human does, but person Christ does it. So all divine given, all the human given, then done. Third, when in Scripture, and see all this is in Scripture, not in theory. Remember we talked about that before too, that Chemnitz is not basing this stuff so much from just kind of rational thought or idealism. He's building it out of what actually happened, out of the narrative, out of what was revealed. When in Scripture, the property of the divine nature is attributed in concreto to the human nature in Christ, as in John 6. If you shall see the Son of Man ascending where he was before, the Son of Man is from heaven. So Son of Man is very much you know, meant to be the human nature, and yet we see it doing divine things. So now we're actually, we're actually saying that the human has something divine, but it's true because of the personal union. In Christ, it's so. So the human has this. He's going to, I was going to do the flip around on four. When in Scripture, the property of the human nature is predicated in concreto of the divine nature. You have killed the author of life. Now, the author of life is a very much divine term, the one who creates life. But killed? How do you do that? So you've just predicated a human aspect, mortality, to the divine. You can't do that in the abstract, but in the concrete, you can that's all he's saying. So in the first one, you're taking the human and giving it to the person. Second one, or the first one is divine to the person, human to the person, and then divine to the human, human to the divine, but through the concrete, union. So now we've got the first four covered. Five, when the properties of the natures are attributed to the person, the things which are property of each nature are attributed in concreto, regardless of which nature is involved. So the mediator between God and man, God has redeemed the church. So the properties are, each nature are given regardless of which one is involved. So they're given to the person in concreto. All the attributes are given. All right? Six, when a property which belongs to one nature, either divine or human, is attributed concretely to both natures. And so he's just trying to think about all the possibilities where Scripture talks about how this kind of works out. So you're saying that a divine is actually kind of credited to both natures. That's all he's talking about. And then finally, when a property which pertains to both natures is predicated of both natures as, for example, Christ's mediator, redeemer, savior. So we, he's, look, he's putting a lot into those words, and we aren't usually maybe as careful to think about the differences, but he is. He's thinking about all the possibilities of what's going on here, what's human, what's divine, and what the references are. He's just trying to be comprehensive. All right? Good. Chapter 14, how this gayness has been taught. And he even puts gayness in quotes to indicate he's not hung up on terminology. You know, there's some flexibility here. So the, how the gayness has been taught. Um, again, you don't have to read everything I'm going over, but there are some things I want to call your attention to even in these chapters. Um, yeah, page 188 is where he talks about the abstract and the concrete a little more thoroughly. Abstract terms which apply to the natures are not predicated of one another, for the natures remain distinct in the union and without commingling. Thus we do not say of the natures that the deity is the humanity, or the humanity the deity, nor do we attribute the properties of the one nature to the abs other in the abstract, for we would not say that the divine nature of Christ was created in time when you were put to death. So, keep the abstract to the, to the natures. Even in the union, we still think about the natures being separate nature. Human and divine stay human and divine. But in the concrete... Concrete terms are predicated of the natures interchangeably and of the hypostasis which subsists in them, in other words, the person living in these natures, within these natures, as when we say that Christ is God or man, that God is man, that the Son of Man is the Son of God, etc. So within the concrete, we can do this. That's why it's even possible. Page 189, Pope Leo. You can even say wild things. God who is always and who always was becomes a creature. So God is a creature? You can't say that. You know, we would bristle at that. No, God's not a creature. And yet, in the concrete, in the hypostasis, the personal union, it's true. God is a creature. So that would be an example of a human attribute being applied to the divine nature. And you can't do that in the abstract, but in the concrete, you can and you must. And this is why you're able to say these really great kinds of things during Holy Week and Good Friday. Oh, woe and dread, our God is dead. That's what we say. And you, know, you don't just say, well, kind of. No, 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 our God is dead. Now, if you want to be really explicit and careful, you would say, according to the human nature. But if you just want to be really inflammatory, you leave that part off. 
and um, it's a lot better. So God is dead. And just let it sit there. Yeah. Would it almost be more accurate to say then God is dead in Christ instead of God is dead in um, you could say that, but it's actually probably most accurate to say all of it. God is dead in Christ according to the human nature. Because Christ dies because of the human nature, according to the human nature. And thus, God died in Christ. Yeah, okay. Right. Yeah. But not the abstract. So did the Father die? No. Did the Spirit die? No. But God died. Right. And God can't be pulled on told apart. Right. Hmm. See, like I said, it gets, it gets sticky quickly. Yes, do you know? Yeah, um, especially so experience in the church color, sometimes the justification means uh, Christ union. Uh, so the just justification is uh, union with Christ. Yeah, yeah. So if you if you justification, union means sometimes share the, uh, some characters mm -hmm. of Christ. So what's the difference between the Well, that was part of what Kevin was trying to get in in an earlier section where he makes it real clear what this union is not. You know, it's not just like always. Maybe that's coming up here yet today. Um, I think that's coming up. Yeah, we'll get into that. In other words, the way that God is present with the believer is not the same way that God is present in Christ. And the way that God is present in the Holy Sacrament is not the way that God is present in Christ. There's a difference. And there's, again, those are the things we tend not to think about. We think, yeah, God lives in me and God's in Jesus. Well, what's the difference? Well, there is a difference. The hypostatic union is very different. The incarnation is a unique presence of God in a localized way, unlike any other way that God is present. So he, he, does, he, even, he does think about that. He thinks about everything. Not much he leaves out. So we can say these crazy things like God is a creature, and then we have page 191, where we've got Luther getting in on this. And it's always fun to see how, um, when Kenneth is quoting the church fathers, he always includes Luther in the list. Um, as a church father, he gives them the same kind of strength and category as Tertullian or Irenaeus or John of Damascus. All right. Third paragraph from the end, second full paragraph. This is exactly the same thing as denying that God or the Son of God was made a man. And it makes such a division in Christ that the deity is considered a person by himself, completely separated from the manhood in itself. It is as if the manhood were personally separated from the divine person. This is plainly contrary to the truth and a blasphemous thing to affirm. But... We say that God was crucified, put to death for us, that he was, has redeemed us by his blood. For there is one person consisting of God and man, a divine and a human nature joined together to form one person, for Christ in reality is both God and man. Therefore what he did, suffered or spoke as a man, he also truly did, suffered and spoke as the eternal God. And again, what he did and spoke as God, he also did and spoke as man. For he is the same son of both the eternal God and the human virgin, one undivided person, but with a distinction of natures. So Luther likes this a lot. And page 192, Luther himself starts getting into this whole concrete, abstract discussion and tries to unpack it and clarify it and does a nice job of that, but we won't mess with that, but that's, it's there. Um, rather thorough, where Luther is trying to explain this one more time, and he does a nice job of kind of laying it out. Well, just to give you an example, about eight lines down. Thus, I am correct in saying that the deity does not suffer, the humanity does not create. For here I am speaking of the abstract and about the deity which is separated. In other words, not considered according to the union. We must not do this. We must not separate the abstract, otherwise our faith is false. We must believe in the concrete, that this man is God. The properties and attributes rightly remain. The humanity does not create. That is when we consider the humanity by itself or when we put it in a separate position or speak of it all by itself. On the contrary, the deity does not die. At this point, we must be absolutely silent about the abstract because faith teaches that there is no abstraction here, but rather a concretion, a conjunction, and a uniting of both natures. Thus, we must speak about these matters in the concrete and say that the Son of the Virgin has saved heaven and earth and that the Son of God suffers and dies. For this is the way Scripture speaks. Okay? And this comes through pretty clearly. Then we have another term introduced in the facing page. Synecdoche. And this is one of those terms you probably encountered somewhere along the way in your um, hermeneutics class, yeah, or an exegetical course somewhere along the way. Synecdoche. And synecdoche means what? A part for the whole. A part for the whole. We have a nice illustration, page 193. Therefore, it is correct to say that the Son of God suffered. For although one part of him, if I may speak in this way, 
the, what the one party's thinking about? The human. Namely, the deity does not suffer. So if he suffers and dies, well, it's according to the human nature, because the deity can't suffer and die. Yet, the person of for which is God does suffer by reason of the other part, that is the humanity. Just as we commonly say that the son of the king is wounded, although only his foot is actually wounded, or that Solomon is wise, although only his soul is wise, or that Absalom is handsome, although only his body is handsome, and in fact his heart's corrupt and wicked, but that's another story. And so that's synecdoche. So you might say, I feel terrible today, when in fact maybe it's just you, your tooth that's hurting. All right, so really what she says, my tooth doesn't feel very good, and so therefore I don't feel that great. And that's synecdoche. So synecdoche in this context of Christology would say that whatever is true of one of the parts, one of the natures, is true of the entire person. So Christ gets hungry? Yes. Well, it's only the human nature getting hungry. Well, no, it's Christ getting hungry because of the union. And what we're stressing here, again, is the complete um, comprehensive nature of the union. It's a complete union. The person has everything. And there we have the end of the next chapter, 14.